you know, the hardest part of filming this stuff is making sure that I don't have like reflections of lights in my glasses all the time. <laughs> um, hi viewers, welcome back to my channel, So Fast I Young. Today we're going to do a bit of a recycling project. Um, I have a, a set of old sheets that I don't want to, um, you know, I can't use anymore on the bed. Um, and so I'm going to actually take the top sheet from it and turn it into a poet shirt for my partner. Um, he is currently playing in a online um, Pathfinder podcast game and wants to eventually be able to do like a full like cosplay of his character. So this might be the beginning of a new series. I'm not really sure. We're going to do the poet shirt. Um, there probably will eventually be a jacket, uh, like a long coat that he once made. So we might do that too. Um, yeah, I think that would be fun, fun thing to kind of like show how to do something that's a little more uh, on like a tailoring type um, level or whatnot. And so in this video we're going to talk a little bit about different construction methods. Uh, we're going to talk about interfacing, gathering, putting in grommets, narrow hem, um, possibly not in that order. I don't, I don't quite remember what order I did it all in, but uh, I thought it would be a fun one to just kind of touch over some basics and whatnot and uh, share them with you. So <laughs> uh, I hope that you enjoy me making pirate shirt, poet shirt, pirate shirt, men's peasant shirt. I am taking this old pair of sheets and I'm going to turn it into a uh, poet shirt. We're going to do that version minus some lace around the collar. So it's going to have ruffles down here, lacing here. It's going to have the shorter version of the placket. There's the short version and the long version of the placket. And it's going to eat up uh, most of this set of sheets, probably. So in order to make the sheet a little more, like, workable, I am kind of breaking it down into sections. I'm not too worried about fabric waste here. Anything that is left is either going to get used on another project or go into my um, scrap uh, pile that I'm collecting for uh, to use as stuffing in another project that I have. Um, I'm gonna make this like poof thing and, and use all of the random extra fabrics that are left over. Um, for the filling. Uh, so this has a pretty strong grain on it. Um, I was actually able to tell, tear it perfectly straight across. So I just, I measured roughly an amount that was slightly longer than the pieces that I needed for the front and back to start, um, just in case it didn't tear evenly. Uh, and tore that, and then I tore that in half so I have enough for the front and enough for the back. Uh, now I'm just going to lay this out and cut the pieces. Well, I'm going to lay this out so that the fold is over here on the... Yeah. So yeah. Front and back will be done. And then I actually still have quite a bit of the top to do the... Um, to do the sleeve out of. I'm actually wondering because of how wide wide this sheet is, I might actually be able to get the sleeve out of the top. I'll have to see. It is, it's this big. So I might be able to get it all out of one and that would be even more awesome because then I don't have to deal with the uh, bottom sheet necessarily. Yeah. Okay, I'm really excited right now because uh, the sleeve will totally fit. This is uh, doubled, so that's actually a fold over there. The sleeve will totally fit um, with plenty of room on this uh, top sheet. So that means I don't have to deal with the bottom sheet. That means I also can confidently say um, if you want to make this uh, this particular simplicity pattern, you can use one queen sized top sheet for all of the pieces. Uh, if you, you know, don't want to buy stuff and you don't know how to estimate, great. I wasn't positive because that sleeve looked huge when I cut it out. Wasn't quite sure it was going to work, but it totally is going to fit. And then there's still plenty of room and I still have other stuff left over 
and pillows and whatnot. Um, I almost wish that the bottom sheet hadn't had a hole because then I could have just used the bottom sheet. Because uh, this top sheet was actually in pretty good condition. But I also couldn't find another matching bottom sheet. Like, they didn't make this particular color anymore. Uh, or I could just get the bottom sheet. So that's part of why I'm chopping this up. It's also just, it's really soft. It's like, this is like, nice. I forget if this was 500 or 800 thread count. But it was a very nice, uh, very nice starting fabric for this. And I think it's going to be a really pretty uh, poet shirt. I forgot to film this section, but I wanted to talk a second about interfacing. So this particular pattern had interfacing in the collar and in this little uh, front placket. So um, the way that I prefer to do interfacing and the way that I think it is easiest is I literally will trace the pattern out of the interfacing first. I won't even cut it out of the fashion fabric. I'll cut it out of the interfacing and then iron it on. I see a lot of people, and I used to do it myself, where they cut the fashion fabric and then they're like, oh, I have to put interfacing in it, so let me, put, let me cut the interfacing and then there's interfacing, like, hanging out over the side and you get interfacing glue all over your iron or all over your ironing board and it's just a mess. So it is, like, ten times better to just cut your interfacing first, then iron it to your fashion fabric, and then cut it out. It, it, it's that easy. Um, that's also how, like, whenever I'm cutting anything, I almost always start with the innermost layer. Um, not necessarily when it's lining, but, like, if I'm flat lining or interfacing, I will cut the flat lining or the interfacing first. Um, so I will cut the innermost layer and then work down. So, like, when I was work, uh, worked on a corset, uh, if it had cut heel flat lined in it, I would do that first, and then... The fashion fabric. If the fashion fabric needed interfacing for more stability, I would do the cotille and then the interfacing and then interface the fashion fabric and then cut. And then I use the cotille layer as my pattern for the interfaced fashion fabric layer, if that makes any sort of sense. Um, but uh, yeah, to me it just works out better and you don't end up with sticky stuff all over your iron. So um, now I've got this all done, I've got my interfacing, everything is cut, ready to go, and I'm going to start construction. I got my placket, and despite the fact that I thought I had this all, like, lined up nicely, the, um, placket didn't look even when I sewed it in. You can see right there, it kind of goes wonky, and that's the hard part with this particular type of stripe. Anyways, I just was really unhappy with it. So... I am redoing it, um, but the problem was is I already put the placket in and then flipped it and then realized how bad it, it looked, in my opinion. Again, this is just my personal opinion. But, um, so what I did is I took a tiny scrap and I've repaired this. That'll end up getting encased inside. It's just going to help hold this back in place because this was pretty close, although even here I feel like my stitching got a little wonky, like it got a little bit wider. So I was extra <coughs> super duper careful this time when I drew my center line my stitching lines and all of that and now I'm going to stitch this on here um, I'm going to drop it just a little bit lower <coughs> um, I made this so that I don't have to worry about recutting into this little um, space and hopefully everything will be okie dokie a okay we'll see yes I'm much happier with how this one came out. It's uh, much straighter the whole way down, uh, even on both sides all the way around. I did give myself a little bit extra room, based like beyond the pattern piece, and I added. I dropped this three eighths, and I added three eighths here, so that I made sure that I still kept it supposed to have an inch all the way around. Because this is actually the outside of the garment, so this gets top stitched. Um, some versions of this pattern, and there's a ruffle that sticks out from underneath here this version I'm not doing the ruffle so that's why it was really important that it be perfect or as perfect as I could get it and here is a very lovely finished top stitched placket um, the lines just look a lot more even they're still probably not perfect but it's much better than it was the first time I tried to do it it looked lopsided 
this time it at least looks correct there's only so because of the way that these stripes are there's only so um um so many so so much i can do to make them look even i guess uh, is what i should say all right if you don't know how to run a gathering stitch yet um i'm just gonna talk about it really quick i guess um so there's a lot of gathering in this because it's a giant poet shirt um i have set my sewing machine oh let's see over here i have set this down to the longest stitch possible and uh, I'm not going to backstitch or anything. You're going to want long tails on the beginning and the end. Um, there's a couple different ways I do gathering. Uh, it kind of depends on... Oops. Why are you caught funny? Um, it kind of depends on what the project is, how heavy the fabric is, a number of things. Um, I'm going to do the really basic way, which is running two running stitches um, next to each other. And gathering that way. Another way that you can do it, another way that I like to do it sometimes, is I like to use a heavy duty thread, um, like a button thread or a hand stitching thread, and zigzag over that. Um, if it's something very heavy, if it's something incredibly heavy, I've done the same thing with um, fishing line, monofilament. Um, uh, I, there was this skirt that was just gigantic and they needed it like all all of the layers like gathered down into this teeny tiny waist and I did that one with monofilament <laughs> uh, because it was the only thing that wouldn't break during the process but um, so I'm gonna stitch this at about a quarter inch and then three eighths or actually no, I'm gonna stitch about three eighths and then half an inch um, and then the final stitch line will be five eighths so everything's within that so no back stitching machine go. And I get to my other mark. Again. Even long tails. So I will repeat that and then I will take the time to find probably, since this is a nice long piece, I'll probably find the center and quarters between those points just so that I have something to help me line it up um, and evenly disperse the pleat, or not the pleats, so that I can evenly disperse the gathers between all of those marks on when I attach to the yoke. The gathering goes right next to this one. Again, no back stitching, long tails, and. pulling this through like machine is doing the work I'm kind of keeping a little bit of tension just so that it doesn't sometimes it'll gather on itself and I don't want it to do that yet so yeah really quick I'm gonna take uh, this, I'm going to line up my points that I'm gathering between. I'm going to find my center. And I can either just clip the fabric, not, not clipping the, uh, stitching at all. I'm clipping all above it. Or you can put a pin in it if you don't, if you're worried about clipping. I just like clipping. It's easier sometimes. Um, and then I'm going to find the sort of quarter points as well just so this is the other way you can mark you can find your quarter points and slide hopefully not actually pinning both layers of fabric like I just did yeah so you can slide some pins in to find your quarter points 
Okay, so those are your options. So now I can gather this and attach it to the yoke. Okay, so I have the front all nice and gathered. I have the back all nice and gathered onto the yoke. And now I have to deal with the stupid neck. Um, and I really should have checked this in the first place, but I really didn't think about it because I was just like, oh, this pattern is for a men's, you know, like, nowhere on here does it a, like, list a neck measurement, actually. I had to measure the pattern. Um, and then I also realized, oh, they do kind of make it so that it purposely sits open. This neck measurement is only, like, 15 and a half inches open. And... Um, I don't know what extra, extra large man actually has 15 and a half inch neck, really, or an extra large man. Um, and I mean, I get that it's supposed to sit open, but because it's so small, like, that's gonna pull funny. Like, you can already see just sitting on my mannequin that it's, uh, that it wants to pull funny, in my opinion. So... I am going to have to, um, I don't really have to do anything to this. I will probably determine a new stitch line that's somewhere closer to, like, 17. So, Devin's neck measures a 17. He usually likes things a little loose. He's going to wear it open, though. So, like, usually the dress shirts are, like, an 18, 17 and a half, 18. Um... I'm going to go for about a 17 on this, um, but that means I have to recut my collar. Womp womp. And I did such a good job of lining up the lines. I don't know, at least I got plenty left over, so I can do that. That's not going to be too hard. It's just kind of annoying. It's like, why, like... Like, and at first I thought, oh, maybe I had marked something wrong. Okay, because, like, I'm going to show you the pattern piece. Because, like, the pattern piece, I was like, oh, maybe, maybe it was supposed to be extra large, you know, to make a larger neck. But no, 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 no. It, there's really not that much difference in size between these necks. And then when I, like, looked at the collar, I was like, okay, that's just... Like, yeah, I mean, look at the difference in sizes. Like, that's not a lot of difference for men's, a men's shirt. And, like, this would probably, if I was making this for myself, this would be perfect. Because I have a tiny neck. It's just funny, because I feel like in women's shirts, they always make um, plus size, like, collars uh, huge. And then in the men's, it's like, this is, like, tiny. Or unisex, whatever you want to call this. I mean, it is technically unisex. But, I mean, yeah, like I said... It, in theory, it's supposed to be worn out oh, open, but if you're going to lace it up, you still want to have a little bit of, like, give. Not that weirdness. I don't know. I just feel like this looks stupid. Like, even if... I don't know, this is getting... This is getting grommets up here. Um, it's just, like, it's sitting way too high up. I mostly am going to end up uh, altering it by dropping it back here. Uh, it's going to get dropped there. It's going to come all the way down to here. Um, in the front too. I'm going to adjust that a little bit, but yeah, it's just one of those silly kind of annoying things that I should have, um, thought more about in the first place, but then didn't. I don't know. I like just like the way that it's pulling like here. I don't know. Like that just, <sighs> well, anyways, yeah. Okay. So I redrew the line. And measured it. I redrew a line around the neck. Um, you can see A, it actually comes down so that this will get covered up by the collar now because for some reason it didn't. I don't know if I cut it a little off, but this will get covered up by the collar. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and stay stitch this and then I'm gonna cut a new um, collar. So we'll see that next. So for stay stitching, um, I'm just going to use longest stitch length and this is just a basting stitch basically for when we uh, cut into this. Come on. Oh, 
that's just a little thick section. The foot pedal on this old machine is also really weird because instead of like a modern foot pedal where you're pushing on the whole thing, it's got this little tiny square you push on um, that's next to another square. I don't know why that is, but sure, whatever. So sometimes my foot feels funny on it. <laughs> stitch done all right so um i basically just made a larger one of these um by i just on the i took the interfacing folded it in half folded this in half because it's got a center back line um i added three quarters of an inch to the center back, which means I added an inch and a half total into this, taking this from um, about uh, 15 and a half, wait, wait, so it's 17 and a half now, so it was about 15, which is really, really damn small for a men's extra large. Um, and it is now a 17 and a half collar and matches the new stitching line I put on here. So yeah. Now let's sew it together. This is typically how I sew something together. I don't use pins very often and I use my foot plate um, as my guide most of the time. So I will simply pl place my two pieces together and stitch along um, using the foot plate for my seam allowance guide. Now uh, you'll notice when I get to the points here I very carefully line everything up and when I get to the actual point when I'm stitching I slow down and sort of hand crank it in so that I can turn my piece accurately. I'm going to actually can create this hole. Don't need this much seam allowance in this. Up next to it, but not actually catch those threads. Again, we're going to clip really close, just a couple of threads away, basically. Now we can go turn it and press it out. I'm turning a corner like that. I'm going to be fairly careful. One of two ways I'll either turn it out. I will either use a safety or a pin or a point turner to help me wiggle that little, little ear out of there. I like to go in with a needle or a, 
a pin over seam ripper because you're less likely to accidentally uh, break threads or fabric. Get it to really nicely work that corner. I get a very, very nice point. Yeah, for some reason, personally for me, pen is my particular favorite tool for this. Um, I know some people will stick their scissors in there, all sorts of other things. I try not to use anything sharp. Uh, because I have actually, actually poked through garments, you know, in the past. You learn your lessons the hard way, usually. Those are pretty too darn close. I think I can work that one just a little bit more. Yep. Those are two incredibly close points once I uh, press them. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing a, so I'm closing up the collar by doing a running slip stitch. Um, and I will be traveling because this is two layers and this is multiple layers. I'm going to be traveling on both. Um, if this was a single layer, I would just be doing like a teeny tiny little prick stitch, like barely catching just a thread or two. But because it's two layers, I can actually travel through it. And you won't see it on the other side. So I came out on this side, I'm going to go in here at about the same height, travel a quarter of an inch, go in on this side at the basically the exact same height, travel about a quarter of an inch. Sorry if this is getting knocked. I'm trying to film and do this at the same time. It's a little trickier than I thought. So. Again, because this has two layers, I'm hiding. There's no stitches that you'll be seeing on the outside. So I can hide the stitch on this side, which means I can travel on both sides. And you don't always have to travel on both sides because like, okay, so if there wasn't, if this was a single, it would just take a little teeny tiny one, maybe two threads. You know, just a little bite, teeny tiny little bite. And then basically go back in the exact same hole that I came out of. Like that. If you really wanted it to disappear. And then on the other side it would just be a teeny tiny little little prick stitch and you wouldn't even see it. But I don't need to worry about that on this one. So. Alright. I'm going to film it. Or I'm going to stop filming because it's hard to do both. Okay. So I'm working on the sleeves now. I have some tracing paper underneath this. It's like a light yellow should be enough um, just to show up. Uh, when I do my when I do my like tracing type of things, especially if I'm doing trying to get like a long straight line, this is a long straight line that I got on things. I won't I won't trace the entire line, okay? I will uh, kind of just trace a couple of points along the way. move everything, do that, and then I will come back with a straight edge with a ruler 
um, and then try to get a nice straighter line with that because you like it's it's hard to like sit there and trace with a tracing wheel so I end up just working with um, there we are there's one so I end up just working with a couple of, of marks along the way um, and then uh, using a, a long straight edge to get the actual straight line that I'm going to use for stitching it's much easier much more accurate, much more likely to be straight. So yeah. So using my uh, the bedge ruler because it helps me just get a really nice straight line. Um, I lined up all of the dots that I had made and placed it and then used it to draw a straight edge. So I got that on both sides of my pattern now for the sleeve. These, pa these sleeves are just ginormous. They're going to be so big and floofy. Okay, I'm going to talk about doing a um, narrow hem. So there's a couple of different ways you can do a narrow hem. If you have a roll hem foot, which uh, I don't for this machine. All right, this is for my other machine, but I'm too lazy to break it out right now because it's buried under things at the moment. This is a roll hem foot. It has a little like cyclone shaped uh, end that helps roll the fabric in. Um, some people find these incredibly useful. Some people find them really tricky. I have learned how to work with them and they're really nice. Um, personally, I find the trick is being able to do a zigzag on whatever it is that I'm uh, roll hemming. Seems to make it work a little bit better. This will give you a really teeny tiny hem. I could also serge the ends of these um, with a pearl edge, but uh, instead I'm going to do a roll hem and, or not a roll hem, I'm going to do a narrow hem, which is what is recommended in the instructions. So uh, this is the wrong side because the blue, so we're doing the hem towards, towards the inside. Um, there's a couple different ways to do this. And it kind of depends on how much you're cutting off. So like when I'm hemming a skirt, if I'm hemming a skirt, like particularly <coughs> something that's long and I've taken off like a huge amount, I'll do this trick where you like fold it on the line and then like stitch right next to the line and then cut it and then fold it again. But we don't have that extra. This is just the, uh, the regular amount of uh, sleeve length. There's no hem or like fitting here. So whoops. Pull my tails through a little bit better so it doesn't suck it up. So basically what I'm going to do is right next to the end, like basically I'm running this uh, just so that it, it barely goes past the needle, if you can see that. Um, and we're going to put a stay stitch. This can be in a fairly long length. Um, somebody also once that I worked with who first taught me this called this the ethel hem. I don't know where exactly that comes from or this variation on the ethel hem. Um, oops. I'm here. Okay. Uh, but basically you're going to run a line really really close to the edge of your fabric okay so you're going to do that all the way along the bottom hem like it's going to be somewhere between like a uh, probably bigger than an eighth but maybe smaller than a quarter of the way and then you're going to go press this if you're a good sewer if you're not like oh i shouldn't say if you're a good sewer but if you're doing things the proper way you should go press it um, you can also, some people will also run a second one, um, if you're working with something very curved or very, uh, very widgy fabric, something that will like shift around. If you run a second one, that actually really super helps. And you can actually use them to slightly like gather in the fabric on a curve. I don't need that for this. This is fairly stable fabric. So I'm just going to run the one. Um, I'm going to go press it. Sometimes when I'm being really lazy, I won't. I will just, like, hold it. But you're going to press this up, and then you're going to press up um, 
just a teeny tiny, a tiny amount, the, basically the width. So I'm going to go press this and then we'll come back and stitch it, okay? Notice uh, when you go to press it that this actually starts to, like, particularly if it's a curve, it starts to curl it the way that you need to. And that's um, part of what this is useful for is getting your curved narrow hem very nice. <sighs> All right, so now we have it nicely pressed, folded, nice narrow hem. Going to... This is also can be called a narrow hem, it can be called a shirt tail hem. Some people use this for shirt tails. Um, because the uh, stand wants to be right in my the way where my arm would normally be for the camera so and then you're gonna hem it it's not good I feel like I need to build a special, like, suspended camera rig or something for this stuff. And there is the hem. Let's, let me press it really quick. And so I pressed it really quick and I just wanted to show you a comparison. This is me doing it where I, um took the time to go press it on the machine, or on the, on the ironing board before stitching it. And this is me just stitching it and pressing it afterwards. So I just want you to understand, um, A, why I say do as I say, not as I do about this sometimes, and you should really always press it. And B, this is, you know, what you get. Now, outside, yeah, you just get a little bit more wrinkle in it. Um, but it also still works. I probably will redo this one just so it looks pretty and perfect. Um, but yeah, like that's just so you guys understand what differences happen when you take the time to press things versus when you rush through it and you don't. All right, and here I am just uh, stitching on some bias binding to make casing for the elastic at the wrist. So I'm just lining it up with my line and top stitching it right now. burr on my needle. Every once in a while I'm just noticing a little, uh, like, caught thread. I should change it out. Change out your needles often. Sometimes they just get old. Oh yeah. Alright, right after this we're gonna change my needle. Okay, so I set my sleeve. I love setting sleeves in poet shirts because they're just so easy because it's like a straight line and a bunch of gathering in the center. Um, I just did my gathering stitch like I did on the yokes with two, uh, two lines of gathering. 
stitched together, stitched it in at the five eighths, and then just I thought I'd show you guys. This is um, how you, how I use my serger most of the time to bind off the seam because this was really uh, really <clears throat> fraying fabric. I didn't need to use it on the yoke or on the collar because that was all encased. So you can, if you want to, you can go ahead. Um, a lot of times in theater sewing will serge everything just because out of like habit but you don't need to um and it sometimes does make seams bulkier but yeah so I just gave it a nice little serge edge to clear it off since I wanted I wanted to serge the side seam this is the side seam of the arm um and the body it's all you do that in one long swoop uh, but I just wanted to I wanted to serge it together but um down here I didn't want the serging showing so I chose to just uh clip right after the elastic and pink this section and then down here at the bottom this is going to be the bottom of the shirt um i clipped at this point and then this section down here is going to get a rolled narrow hem so yeah just thought i'd explain what's going on okay let's talk about grommets for a second so i um you can buy grommets at the store like at Joann's or whatever but I don't particularly like the Dritz grommets um, they're not very good in my opinion they have a tendency to kind of not uh, seal well and metal has a tendency to split and like cause sharp bits and stuff so I don't like to use them when I have the opportunity I like to go ahead and get like really good professional grade grommets um, these are there's a couple different places you can get these. I like to shop around for the cheapest price. When I'm getting a big Wack order, I will order them from Wack. This set um, I actually ordered just the other day because I didn't have any silver ones. I ordered from eBay um, and got a pretty good price on them there. And then I also have this grommet setter. You can see this is very different than the kind of cheap grommet setter that is provided in the Dritz kits as well. So this is like heavy duty, like very solid, very heavy. Um, so these are the grommets that I'm using. I'm using a size zero. Um, I like size zeros personally. Some people like double zeros. Um, those are a little bit smaller. Those are closer to like an eyelet size, but I like the, the size zero, which is pretty much what I have. And these, this, I think I got, I either bought this on Moac or I bought this one on eBay too. Um, I don't quite remember. Again, I shopped around and found the cheapest price for what I was trying to get. Um, because some places, like, will sell this for way more money than you can get it at other places. Um, there was one grommet setter that was like 30 bucks, and I was like, I think I can get that cheaper because I know I bought them cheaper before, and then I found this one, I think, for 15 So, um, check around. Don't assume that you can only get the price at one place. Um, so the other things that I'm, I need are a nice big rubber mallet to set each one of these grommets. Um, I can't find my big all, so I'm going to start my holes with this. And then I have this weird thing. I personally love to use a, um, uh, knitting needle to help me set these because this fits right on it. I will end up like shoving the fabric through and working the hole until it is this big and onto this and then place it. So it, yeah, it's just, this is something I started doing in one of the theaters I used to work at and it still is my preferred way to set grommets is to, rather than, okay, so like, if you open a hole slowly using um, an awl, and spreading the fibers you end up with less broken fibers than if you cut a hole and put your grommet through why this is important is in some fabrics when you cut the hole it like then it will continue to grow the fibers can pull out it can rip easier the fewer cut fibers the better off you are so that's why i take the time and it, it takes a little bit longer because i have to sit there and sort of work the fabric and I'll show you in a minute kind of got to work the fabric down the all um or down the point um to get it to open but it does I think they have a tendency to last longer personally especially when put under large amounts of strain um 
But to each his own. I mean, some people really like to just use the little leather punch and punch a hole and then call it good. Um, you can do that too. This is just my preferred way. Okay, I got one coming in. I wanted to do one first before I went into showing you guys how I do this. <laughs> so like I said, I prefer to make holes with a... Um, through other means, not through cutting. Okay? It's just my personal preference. Um, because I feel like, I mean, you're still going to get some pulled fibers, but you're not going to get as many as if you cut. Okay. Then I put this on here and I kind of hold that down. And wiggle this shirt up and on. Now it's on. Right? So, and then you take your other half, put that on. Um, you know, every time I do this, I never remember, like, if it matters if you put it, like, sandwiching or if you put it, like, because there's a, there's a rounded part. I never remember if you put the rounded part up or the rounded part down. I usually do the rounded part up, I think, because you get rounded on top and rounded on the back, but it's one of those weird, weird things. And then you're going to take your grommet setter and your giant mallet and hit it really hard. I'm not going to do it on screen for multiple reasons. One, it's noisy. Two, I can't do it on this desk. I actually have to take it out to my balcony and do it on the cement. Um, I'm going to prep all of these first and then go hammer and try not to disturb the dogs downstairs too much. Yeah. Because I feel bad for the puppies. I don't want them to be disturbed by my hammering. <sighs> I don't know. Maybe I should point out the fact that you won't be able to do this particular, like, spreading method. I only use it on small, on, like, eyelet size zero, double zeros and one, zeros. Um, anything bigger than you kind of do have to cut into it, like, um, especially when you're getting into large grommets. But... I just thought I would mention that, just in case, you know, anybody felt otherwise. Alright, I'm gonna, like, do a soft set in here. See? I made lots of noise. I made things jump around. But now this isn't gonna come off while I put all of them on and take it outside. So. I hope you enjoyed watching me make a poet shirt out of a bed sheet. Um, I think it turned out really cute. It's got a lot of um, potential for it. My husband, um, him and his friends do a uh, bi-weekly podcast where they play Pathfinder 2nd Edition. It's called The Drunk and Geek. And uh, he, this is actually going to be part of a cosplay for him eventually for his character, uh, Cipriannis who's a half-orc swashbuckler. So, um, uh, there might be some more videos coming down the line of me making a coat and pants and helping him get all, like, done up for that. We'll see. Um, yeah. Uh, if you liked the video, please hit the thumbs up. Give my videos a like. Check out some of my other videos. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so that you can get notifications of when I upload. I do try to upload once a week, every Wednesday. Sometimes it comes a little late on Thursday. It all depends on how cooperative my editing photo, photo sh stuff is being. Please feel free to leave me some comments, questions, you know, ideas in any of my videos. Um, or, you know, interact with me. I do love hearing from everybody. And I hope you all have a great week. Uh, I love you. Bye. Hello, my wonderful viewers. And welcome back to So Fast I blah, 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 blah. Ooh, that's attractive. I should put that at the end of the video.